Welcome to Sidetrack Deep Dive number two, a subject that I feel like really hasn't been covered in the way that it ought to be over time. And there seems to be a lack of understanding around what really happened. And what I'm going to offer you will not be a definitive deep dive into exactly what happened, but it is going to be an anecdotal representation of what I feel is the biggest rule change to come in the sport of pulling. But before we get to that, this deep dive is brought to you by our friends at Lock Performance LLC in Napanee, Indiana. Your number one shop in Northeast Indiana. They use what they sell, they sell what they use. Where it comes to maintenance and custom builds, you name it, they can take care of you. Tristan Raymer and the gang there um, all work super hard. And they're not just fans of the sport, they're pullers. They put their money where their mouth is and support some of the uh, highest levels of the sport of, of diesel uh, truck and tractor pulling with their hometown event even two times a year coming every spring and every fall with me. You're stuck with me on the mic when you go down in Apennee. Now, sidetrack deep dive number two. This has to do with roll cages. What you're going to see in this film has... None of none of this is brand new. None of this is is footage that hasn't been seen anywhere else. It's all stuff that has been shown anywhere else on the web, even on the sidetrack page. But it's never really been brought together in a meaningful way so that people understand it. I've seen way too many comments on individual clips where people just don't seem to understand what it's all about and how it came to be. And I really want to concentrate that into one central video. For the longest time in the sport of pulling. Rollover protection really wasn't a thing. From its very earliest beginnings in the 1960s, right through the late 1990s, it was never compulsory. You didn't have to have it. And the number of vehicles that did have it were few and far between. Starting in the 1980s, some of the mini rods started to have rollover protection. And up through the 1990s, a lot of the minis would have it but it wasn't required for them to do it. They were the wildest ride. They were the 12 second bucking Broncos of the sport. So many of the guys felt like it was something that they needed to have. But when it came to the bigger tractor classes, that was just extra weight you were going to have to carry and you were going to have to carry it in a place that wasn't seen to be advantageous. It was up nice and high. And even in 1984 at Bowling Green, even Steve Evans thought about comment, commenting on it in the light super stock class with this big international as he gets hooked up to that sled notice that the rules require that he wear a helmet otherwise uh, he's not particularly heavily uh, armed with safety gear uh, here steve well you really don't need it to speak to these tractors go brock you know the driver uh, has the option of positioning the sled wherever he wants it in the starting area and danny here put it so we fast forward to 1991 emily city michigan this is a video that i showed you a little while ago todd gilliland running in the light modified class, three, three engines on it, first time ever, he gets bucked out of the seat. It was a really high in the chassis seating position. Uh, there, he was not down in between the frame, the, the fenders so much, and he got tossed over the side when it let loose. A lot of the commentary was, oh, that's stupid, what an idiot, how come he didn't have a roll cage, how come he didn't have a lap belt that held him in the seat? As you'll see in this clip, Todd bounced up off the ground, thankfully. It hurt, but he was okay. Take a look, and then we'll go from there.
So Todd didn't have any sort of restraints in the seat to hold him down in the tractor. This is something that would come to, in the coming years, be a bit of a debate. Again, roll cages still weren't a thing. It was still too heavy. It was still too much of a hassle. Whatever the excuses were that were offered, it was a competitive disadvantage if you had one versus those who didn't. But by the time that we rolled up to 1996, some drivers were starting to use a, a lap belt restraint to hold them down into the chassis. And as you're going to see at Kasopolis, Michigan, with Judy Knipstein in 1996, you can have a lap belt. And yes, it will hold you down in the seat, but it's going to hurt. held down in the seat. The tracker didn't go over, but man, did she get whiplash. And I know it hurt. She was sore, had to have been, for several days after that particular incident. And remember that. When it comes to lap belt restraints, we're going to get to back to that in just a moment. The next clip we're going to see is the one that everyone knows. This goes to Fort Recovery, Ohio, 1998, filmed by Ted Coverdale. It's the Walsh brothers in the Irish Challenger on the Little Key Limiter. Everyone knows this clip and everyone swears this is the reason why we have roll cages today. And they're not wrong. It is a big piece of why we do have roll cages in the sport of truck and tractor pulling. But it's not the only reason. We'll get to why it's not the only reason in a second. But of a particular note on the Walsh Brothers triple turbine is that they did voluntarily have a roll cage. It wasn't built to any sort of SFI spec. That didn't exist yet. It was to come one year later for 1999, mandated by NTPA. Thankfully, they did have a bit of a roll cage. There's more wrong with this particular scenario, which we'll talk about after you look at it.
Thankfully, the Walshes did have that roll cage. Yes, they walked away from this particular incident. Worst he had was a broken wrist. And thankfully, from everything you've seen and everything you're going to see in this video, no one was killed. And to the best of my knowledge, no one was ever killed in a rollover incident within the sport of pulling. Have there been fatalities during the sport? Yes, there have been due to fire, due to medical reasons, but never due to a rollover or an impact sort of scenario. And thank God it hasn't happened. And pray to God it never will going forward. This particular incident, thankfully, they did have the cage, as mentioned, on the tractor. But there was a lot more that was involved in this. The Lidke sled had several things that were wrong with it. The kill switch engagement didn't work. The brakes didn't work. The ability to stop the box didn't work. The drive chains broke on the sled. This happens on competition sleds a couple of times a year. No one wants to see it happen. No one prays for it to happen. It just does. But in this particular scenario, it was a perfect storm. So much so that the Walsh's actually turned around and sued the Ludkey Eliminator sled. And it was appealed and to go to some higher courts. You can find that on Google, but uh, they, they didn't win that case because competition vehicle. Now let's go to the other particular instance where we really had a driving force for why we needed rollover protection in the sport of pulling beyond what happened to the Walsh's. Also in 1998, earlier in the year, in June, late June, Tomo, Wisconsin, the Super Nationals, and for that particular event, TNN was once again live broadcasting the entire event, but they were focusing on the pit side track, which was covering classes like the Unlimited, and they were ignoring what was going on on the grandstand side, concentrating their particular coverage. Rodalyn Knox and the Sassy Massey was your winner in the Unlimited class, and she performed her victory interview at the end of the track. But I want you to pay attention to this interview. She sees something off to the side. She glances at it, not once but twice, and you hear the shocked roar of the crowd. She was a professional. She finished that interview. What did she see? Rodalyn, congratulations to you. How's it feel? The whole family's involved in this, as we saw in the feature piece earlier, with Brian uh, tuning everything up for you out there. Uh, how gratifying is it to know that, that, that all of your family's involved in, this, in the sport and in bringing you to victory here? It's wonderful. It just gives me a lot of confidence having my family with me. My son Brian is my crew chief and builds the engines and does this, such a great job with the fuel systems. And my husband John and our crew member Ted Barris, who's from Holland, came all the way here to help us this year. So it's wonderful. Congratulations, go get you some champagne. Thanks very much. Ronald and Knox is the What she saw was not a part of TNN's broadcast. And really, probably a good thing that it wasn't. What you're going to see has been posted on the internet. I'm not the first one to bring this to you. But this is not easy to watch. Remember our conversation earlier about Judy Knipstein, about lap belts without a roll cage. In the early 2000s, I worked in road construction. I was a, a project coordinator for a road builder here in Southeast Michigan, and our corporate safety manager was an ex-OSHA guy. We had, I don't know, 600 people on the payroll, so to speak, and every year we had the annual safety meeting. He would always talk about, if you're operating a piece of equipment for this company where it has four post or two post ROPs or a, ca or a cab, I want you wearing the safety harness. I want you wearing whatever seatbelt, lap belt, whatever's in there, I want you to wear it. If it doesn't and it has a lap belt, do not wear it. I want you tossed away. What you're going to see is what happens when you don't have rollover protection and you do have a lap belt. This is Randy Rose and Superstock on the grandstand side. This isn't easy to watch. Oh, 
Randy was severely hurt in this accident. He wasn't killed, thankfully. To this day, though, he is still hurt. He would never pull again. For 1999, National Tractor Pulling Association will require SFI spec roll cages in all their tractor classes going forward. It would be a couple of years later that ATPA, which was then to become PPL, would adopt it. Here locally, many of the, the brush groups, and I hate to use that term, but it's what, what people re colloquially refer to them as, would not adopt it until roughly 2008, maybe a little later than that. But it's a good thing that they did. This is what can happen when things go wrong. But it isn't quite the end of the story. When we first saw roll cages appear on the scene in 1999, 2000, we saw these cages that were absolutely gigantic. I mean, just huge. They would surround guys, and they'd be way up top. And, and the thinking, I think, was, among many competitors, was I want this thing as far away from me as I can have it. So if something goes wrong, I can cinch the belts tight, and I won't hit the bars. Of course, competitors being what they are, over time, they realize that's heavy, and I want to tighten things down. I want to get it closer and have it have it more more intimate. And there really, there is, having sat in one of those roll cages, having pulled a tractor with a roll cage, there's a sense of intimacy there. There's a sense of comfort at having it surround you. But I don't quite think the rule book has gone far enough. There's no requirement for any sort of lateral head restraint. And as you're going to see in this clip of the Haney team, if you don't have that sort of lateral head protection, you don't have to have the tractor roll over for you to go night night. I'm happy the rule cages are here. I'm proud of this development for the sport, but I really would like to see it go a little bit farther and require the ISP lateral head restraints that you see in, in funny car cages and drag racing. I think it's a good add. And the whiplash collar is good, but even beyond that, perhaps the sport could devise some sort of system that is akin to the Hans device. Now, the Hans device was created to prevent a basilar skull fracture, which is meant to stop a head going forwards and aft. In our sport, that's really not the issue. We're traveling at the most 40 miles an hour. A frontal impact just isn't a thing. But the side-to-side -side really is. And a system designed based off of that that can limit the ability of the head to go side-to-side -side really would be a, an advantageous advancement in addition to the ISP 3 point protection in the roll cage. So that's the basis of rollover protection. Again, not definitive. It's not exactly what happened or why it happened. But anecdotally, it is a little bit of a look into how we got here in 1999 and how we are still here today in 2000 or 2021. In the meantime, thank you for joining us. This is Sidetrack Deep Dive number two. We still have more to share with you. Please visit us at sidetrackproductionsinc.com. The merch store is there with swag for you. The update section will have updates on clips of the day, podcasts, everything else. The podcast library is there. You can also find the podcast on RSS and also on Google Podcasts, iTunes, or whatever they call themselves now, TuneIn app, and also Spotify. Thank you for joining us. Until next time, I'm Charles. This is sidetrack.